Hey guys, welcome to today's video. I'm joined by my friend Bruno here in my house. Thanks for coming over. Of course. Bruno is one of uh, one of the biggest watch guys that I know. And it's really cool because you actually you work at an authorized dealer. I do. And it's your passion. Yes. The watches are your passion as well. So we've got Bruno's collection here, but before we really jump into the video, let's do a wrist check. Bruno, sure. what are you wearing? So I am wearing one of the new Seiko 5s. Um, SRPD81 is I, I think that's the reference. Uh, um, it's my motorcycle watch. It's something that if I happen to take a spill, it can break and I won't feel that bad. Uh, <laughs> and it's your so latest watch. It's right? my latest watch. I've had it for 48 hours. That's so. awesome. I'm wearing a borrowed watch. I've got the Tudor GMT here on a German made state mesh. I've got permission from Mike to wear this watch. I normally I don't wear a borrowed watch um, unless, they, unless the owner tells me to, but um, Bruno, do you have a collecting philosophy? Um, no. If you look here, there's kind of a weird assortment of watches from a solar powered citizen with an LCD display all the way to the newest Rolex GMT Master II, um, the Batman. Um, my philosophy really just comes down to, you know, I find something, I like it, and if I can afford it, it's there. <laughs> um, so I, I can't, I get that. The, the thing that I think is pretty cool, I'm sure you guys know this feeling, like you walk into an authorized dealer and you want to, let's say, look at a Speedmaster, for example, you've got a beautiful sapphire sandwich here and you've already watched videos about it. You know everything about the movement, the history, and you go into an authorized dealer and a sales associate pulls it out of the case and, and they're like, oh, that looks beautiful. Oh yeah. That's, oh, is that a coaxial? Oh no. You know, they, they're not terribly knowledgeable. And that's not the case with Bruno. You can go in here and he can tell you more than probably you know about all the watches in the case and, and he's got, you know, he owns it. So. I try my best. <laughs> yeah. So that, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, why don't you go through Bruno? What do you, how did you get into watches, I guess? Is... Um, that's a good question. So back when I was in eighth grade, I think, um, my mother gave me a black rectangular fossil watch. Um, and I wore that up until I got into high school. Um, and after I got into high school, I, you know, I started realizing that, you know, this was an interesting piece of technology that was on my wrist. Um, and this wasn't anything fancy. It was a quartz powered, simple chronograph fossil. Mm. Um, so I started looking into it more and I started realizing that without knowing anything mechanically about the watches, there was something cool going on and I knew nothing about it. So I started researching and researching, um, and in 2015, I started working for a company called Precision Time, which has oh, now got yeah, it's, it's, it's now gone out of business. Um, huh. But that was my gateway drug into the watch industry, okay. um, and that's where I started really learning about watches and kind of getting a passion for it. So, what came next here? I mean, I don't see the fossil you were talking about. I don't. The fossil broke on me, and I didn't care to get it fixed because it was too expensive. <laughs> um, <laughs> more than the watches were. More, way more than the watches were. Um, so the first watch that I acquired sitting on the table here would be this Citizen. Um, and it was a whopping $800 in MSRP back in 2016. Oh, wow. um, and it was the scariest purchase of my entire life. You spent 800 on this? Yes. Um, because I still didn't know much. I didn't know I could get it secondhand at a better price. I didn't <laughs> ever think to ask for it at a discount. Um, and then I should probably add this in. By the time I bought this watch, I was no longer working at Precision Time, so I couldn't get any of the employee benefits. Um, Did you buy it from uh, Precision Time? No, I bought it from... Do you remember anything? I don't even remember. Massey's okay. maybe at the time. Okay. Um, oh, um, yeah. I think, I think they carry some Yeah, so, they do. But it, it's, it's been a great watch for me. Um, I don't wear it much anymore because it's a little big. Yeah. But otherwise, it's a great piece. Um, so you kind of had to self-educate, I guess, into and whole experience it, entirely <laughs> entirely and that's probably part of when you're at work and you're selling rolex and tudor and omega brightling paddock hermes part of it is you've got to educate the client that's coming in yes. to a degree without coming across as nerdy or overbearing yes. yes right which is hard to do when people start asking technical questions i bet um but it's just good to know what you're interested in and i figure you know i work with watches it is the it's almost sole product that I sell. Uh -huh. I like watches. It makes sense just to learn about them. The more you learn about every brand, um, 
the more you start realizing every brand excels at doing something specific, which I yeah. think is an issue that the bulk watch industry does not fully understand nowadays. Um, everybody is so focused on Rolex and Patek mm -hmm. and AP, and that's so lame because <laughs> there's so many great watch brands out there. True that. Even though I'm, I've got a soft spot for all three of them. Oh, I do. <laughs> so, well, so, okay, you, you got this one. What would be the next acquisition and why is it special? Um, that would be this watch right here. So that is a 1965 long jeans. I have no idea of the reference, uh -huh. um, but it was my grandfather's retirement watch way back in 1965. Um, it's engraved with his little thank you note from the company he used to work for. That's so cool. Um, it, it originally came on a mesh rose gold bracelet, which uh -huh. was just awesome. Um, is this filled solid? What, what kind it's of? It's solid 14 karat gold. Which How is cool is that? Cool. And we'll, we'll get a close up shot with the inscription. Um, Beautiful little watch. It was before they started doing applied logos for the long jean wings. Right. Um, so it's just. It looks like it. it's in very clean condition. It is. It's pretty good. For, so, for a watch good. from the 1960s, mid 1960s. That's impressive. That watch is three times older than I am. <laughs> um, well, I guess, Bruno, that is part of the draw of watches is they can be generational. Absolutely. And but, I don't, maybe your grandfather wasn't passionate about watches like Not you are. But he could have been, and he could have been yes. experiencing some really cool stuff, just like you're currently doing now. I agree. I guess 2020. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I get the appeal of becoming a watch guy yes. and delving into the details and the history and the, mm -hmm. the technologies and stuff, which I know this one. Why don't you tell this story? I know a little bit so, about this watch. But. For those of you who have followed Bruce's channel for a little bit, you've probably seen a video or two about the SLC Chrono Meetups. Um, we're a little watch club here in wow. Utah and across the United States um, that gets together and we just share our passion. You know, it's a bunch of watch guys talking watches. What more can we ask for? Yeah. Um, but and you help run it. Like I, you, I'm one of the four you, guys who runs it. You set so up the meetings and the locations. It's a, it's a fun little event. Yeah. Um, this watch was an opportunity that I had back in May of 2019. Wow. Um, and there's an association called the AWCI, the American Watch and Clock Institution. Mm -hmm. um, and they focus on spreading interest in watchmaking and, and teaching different people about that. Um, and they have a mobile RV trailer that travels across the United States and allows different customers um, to build their own watch. Um, and I've been selling watches now for about four, almost five years. Um, and you can talk about watches and read about them every single day. Yeah. And you will never fully understand how much goes into a watch until you build one yourself. <laughs> And um, you spend all day. It was it was doing it's an eight-hour eight course, and yeah. it's a surreal experience. Um, you know, the second you drop the balance bridge in with the balance wheel attached, and everything starts ticking, it is the most emotionally uh, triggering and sensational moment <laughs> I've ever experienced. Yeah, because it's the closest thing to life that I've ever seen happen in front of me. Gotcha. Um, very very cool to see. Um, so you built this. This has an Etta hand wind movement. It's an, it's an Etta 6497. Let's get a little um, shot. Beautiful of this. movement. Um, I nicked the screw right above the barrel, which oh, is, you, okay, did? you can see it very slightly. Um, oh, yeah. That's my love mark on the watch. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome experience. So do you wear that very much? What do you wear frequently um, out of what you have here? So before the Seiko, the last watch I purchased was the Speedmaster. Uh -huh. um, and the Speedmaster has been my most worn watch for the past three months, by far. Would you say that's honeymoon phase or you just connect with this more than maybe some of your other I phases? connect with it wholeheartedly more than any other watch in this collection right now. Really? Um, the Speedmaster, for those of you who have not looked into it very much, um, it is in no sense a luxury watch, even though it's priced like a luxury watch. <laughs> it's good um, description. It is so violently old school. Yeah. And it is so good. It more so, so if you get good. the Hesselite too. Like more so if you get the Hesselite. Um, I don't have the courage for the Hesselite. Yeah. Um, and I like seeing the, the caliber in this watch. I think it's, it's, it's really well decorated for the, for the price point. Yeah. Um, and the dial is perfectly balanced. I love that it's a matte black dial with white indexes. I mean, it's, it's a raw mechanical masterpiece and it just works wonders. So I, I gotta ask you, do you have another one of those at your store right now? I do. You do? I do. Oh, dang. We have a really cool one I want you to film a video on too. Okay. So. <laughs> hey, this one is seriously one that I wanna purchase as well. So it's cool to see it here in hand and hear Bruno really connecting with it and enjoying wearing it more so than the Batgirl, a beautiful two-tone date just yes. and even a watch that he made himself. Yes. That's, that's pretty so awesome. The next one here um, is an Archimede. 
Um, and for those really big watch enthusiasts, you've probably seen this watch um, in different YouTube videos and websites. Um, they're the closest competitor to Stoa, yeah. I believe. Um, this has an ETA 2824. Nice. Um, it does not have a date function. but Is that bronze or brass? It is bronze. Bronze? It is the worst alloy of bronze in the, in the industry. Oh, is it? Um, I've had this watch for three and a half years, and I wore it for three and a half years twice a week, and nothing ever happened to it. So I said, <laughs> screw it, and I put it in a tub with... with uh, smushed boiled eggs and it patinaed. Um, <laughs> Does it turn your wrist green if you wear it like no. three or four days in a row? No. no. Uh, most bronze alloys nowadays are pretty good, so they don't oxidize like copper actually will, which gotcha. is pretty good. Let's see, did we miss any watches? We haven't really talked about the Rolex this year. So let's talk about them. Yeah, that's the fun stuff here. Um, let's start with the date just since that was my first Rolex. Um, when I started getting into watches after the fossil, one of the first watches that I saw was this Datejust. Um, it's, it's a steel and yellow gold 36 millimeter Datejust with fluted bezel and a Jubilee bracelet and the classic champagne dial. Yeah. Um, when I think Rolex, that's the watch that comes in my head. No, no other watch comes to my head. Um, and I like that it's a smaller case. I was used to wearing the long jeans, so it felt natural on my hand. Uh -huh. um, it's just, you know, great iconic Rolex. Do you find like, let's say you're wearing your sapphire sandwich or your back girl, and then you put this on, does it feel too small or does it feel very natural? It feels very natural. Um, I think the watch industry nowadays has gotten much bigger uh -huh. than what most people think is uh, comfortable. Yeah. If you put on a 34 millimeter watch nowadays, it's still really good, especially yeah. when it's a well-proportioned 34. The 36, um, these it's feel great. a little bit bigger than a true 36, right? It is. That probably, that's probably closer to a 38 if, in actuality. So you might have run across, across excuse me, clients that are shopping Rolex and they think, oh, there's no way I could do 36. It has to be, you know, I can never do anything under 40. But you put it on, have you ever sold someone something been, that they weren't expecting? I've, I've sold more 36 millimeter day just than 41, guaranteed to, really? to male to audience. Male. Um, because... You know, whether it be watches, cars, or clothing, there's a pretty big vintage trend happening right now. Yeah. And people sure. are realizing that smaller watches are still interesting. And especially when you start looking at really high horology, um, you don't see 40 millimeter very frequently. Most of yeah. it, especially with Patek, a lot of the watches are going to be smaller case dimensions. Um, and it just feels good on the wrist. It's, it's, it's a nice, comfortable piece. So, if I may, this thing is so cool because of the, the hidden... Hidden crown glass. Yeah. Um, I love that. It's my favorite part of the watch, and it's my least favorite part of the watch. Why is um, it? Why is that? When it's clasped, it's incredibly beautiful because it's totally flush. When it's clasped and I'm hot, there's no adjustability and it, ch it chokes my wrist. Um, so you got easy link in this Jubilee, but yes. you're just out of luck. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons I like this GMT so much. It has a Jubilee bracelet. It feels just as comfortable on the wrist, but I have more adjustability. Um, and it is a totally different watch, uh -huh. different metal colors, different colors for the dial and for the bezel. Um, and you know, it doesn't help that it's a, you know, pretty interesting piece right now. Yeah. I got to ask you something. Um, I don't know, maybe you guys have run across this as well, but when you're out in public and you're wearing a watch, has anybody ever noticed one of your Rolexes and commented on it? Like oh. outside of working at the boutique? Um, no. Uh, I haven't either. I, it's, it, I, I think it's a, I get to deal with an audience every day that thinks, you know, the second you buy a Rolex, you're the coolest person in the world. <laughs> um, I need to stress this. You're not. Nobody cares if you have a Rolex. That's so We true. care if you have a Rolex. Yeah. Um, and we like listening to the stories of why they got the watches and what makes that one so cool. Is there historical relevancy for the watch? Yeah. Um, you know, what cool technological features does the watch have? Um, no, nobody's so ever no commented ever, on that. I, I gotta say, <laughs> when I'm out and about, I usually notice what people are wearing. You know, I'm always looking at the wrist. wrists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and occasionally, I've come across someone that's wearing something other than like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit yes. or something. And a couple times, I've seen Rolexes. One time, I was at Niagara Falls on a family vacation, and I saw a guy wearing a Daytona white awesome. dial. Uh, this was pre-ceramic; it just sure. had the stainless bezel. And I, I, I went, I walked, there's tons of people around, right? And I, I go up to him like, hey man, I love your Daytona. And he looked at me like I was about to like pull a knife out and like yeah. stab him or something. And so I tried to like make him feel better. I'm like, oh look, I've got my GMT on today. And I was wearing my, he yeah. still looked at me funny and it was, 
it was a, it was a little bit awkward yeah. to be honest. So I've had similar experiences. <laughs> so yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, we've talked a little bit. Of, well, I guess tell us what's it like owning one of the most desirable Rolex models out there. Um, personally, I love the watch. I think it's perfect. Um, it's the new case dimensions, and this is something that's really hard to express without having the watches in person. Mm -hmm. um, but if you compare Bruce's GMT to mine. The case on mine, and the lugs especially, they taper a little bit more. A little bit more slender? Um, it wears like a smaller watch. Wow. I think that feels incredible. Hmm. Um, I love blue. I don't like the blue on the Pepsi GMT. Yeah. So this was the obvious choice for me. Yeah. Um, and the Jubilee bracelet, you know, this one has its downsides. This one has been perfected. Um, if there's one watch on the table that I had to, re had to wear for the rest of my life, it would be this GMT without a doubt in my mind. It really? is the most versatile watch in the collection. Um, even though you connect more with the sapphire even though i connect more this wow. you know it looks good on different straps um i was going to put it on erica's original to bring it over but i forgot to do that um but it still is a manual one which i love uh -huh. but for everyday use you know it's not the most practical and the rolex i physically can't pinpoint a complaint on on this specific watch it's as close to perfect as i've ever seen on a watch that make that does make sense so so i I'm, I'm, I'm i'm hearing rumors that this is going to be updated here real soon. I and hope. you want that to happen. I hope. Yeah. Because oh. if they do, they're probably going to do what is it called? The 3861 caliber. So. It was whatever movement they just put in the 50th anniversary Speed okay. Master. So they probably do that, and they would probably come with a nice price increase, which would in, in turn affect your value on the secondary market, right? Yes. Maybe not initially, but over time. Probably you know, it's that. going to be interesting to see what happens with that because, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, if you play with a modern sapphire sandwich, it doesn't feel like a over-the-top luxury watch in yeah. the same sense that either of the Rolexes or any Rolex for that matter feel. Um, and especially when you look at the movement on this, um, they tried to stick as close to the original 321 as they could. So it's still styled like the old Lamania based movements. Uh -huh. um, it really is an old movement. I mean, it, that is there is no modern technology in this watch. Non-hacking. Um, Non-hacking. It's not super accurate. It's not a chronometer. It's not particularly accurate. It's, it's not a chronometer. Um, I don't. I don't know what the frequency is off the top of my head. Three hertz. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, it's horizontal clutch uh, with can actually levers. Yep. Um, no column wheel, guys. No column wheel. So I mean, it works wonders, but it's not sophisticated by any means. Um, and um, the, the new three twenty one is terribly overpriced so yeah no well i guess if it's being made by hand basically by a couple guys over there maybe one guy i think it's one watchmaker so <laughs> yeah um, that, they'll put a premium on that for sure yes they will it'll be fun to see it in person yeah so so tell me bruno i know you said you have no real philosophy other than if it really grabs you mm -hmm. speaks to you what's on your radar for the next purchase um, one of three watches. Um, I think the one that I'm eyeing down the most is probably going to be a Cartier tank. Okay. Um, medium sized tank, oh. not the large. Okay. Um, going back to what we talked about. Yes. Traditionally sized Tra watches. Traditionally sized. Are fine. Um, <laughs> You'll and we'll live, right? If you've tried on, I think you've had a Santos before. Or yeah, I, I had the Santos XL, the older generation, and that yes. thing was a beast. Massive. It's big. And cool. Um, and they, it, it's a really solid watch, and I would, but I want one of the smaller tanks, um, and I just I don't have a rectangular watch anymore, and I want one because it's going to be my luxury version of the Fossil, essentially. Oh, okay. Um, if not the tank, um, a Tudor Black Bay 58 would be a very, very good choice for me. Yeah. Um, one of my friends just picked one up last Friday. Really? Um, and I forget how incredible of a watch it actually is because it doesn't feel like a normal Black Bay. I mean, it, it, it's, it feels like a... 5513 to me mm. um, and I love that if I like I know you can't divulge anything mm. sometimes you have foreknowledge but do you think like personal opinion they're gonna expand the 58 line on Tudor's part or is this gonna be a one-and-done cool model that they release I think that would be a very disappointing thing if they did that yeah um, I think the 58's had enough success both on the retail side and on the enthusiast side uh -huh. um, that it, it would justify them discontinuing most of the standard black base and, and just them as the 58 K size because it is objectively better right. um, I don't think there's an opinion there I think the 58 is a objectively better watch <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to come visit you yeah, try on this please. maybe buy it and do you have a 58 there right now or no I can probably source one by the you, time you get there you think so okay 
<laughs> this is exciting, guys. Um, so, okay, you've gone through two, Black Bay 58. Oh, ten, and the what's third. What's the last one? Um, so this is one that my Seiko here was kind of meant to replace. Um, I still want an SKX. Mm -hmm. um, and you can pick one up for like $200 right now. They're starting incredible. to creep up a yeah. little bit. Um, so I don't know. I think because I just got this, it's probably going to be pushed back a little further. Um, but I just want the red and blue bezel SKX is just an attractive oh, watch. Nine, so. Pepsi. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, for those viewers who are in Utah, please come visit OC Tanner Jewelers. Um, I promise you it is not as intimidating as you may think. Um, myself, John, who has been mentioned on the channel before, um, we're watch enthusiasts through and through, and if you come and specifically request for us, we will spend three hours talking watches with you, and I will show you every single watch in the store. Um, I think it's great for a younger audience to be able to see something that maybe isn't realistic yet, yeah. uh, but I think the exposure is wonderful, and knowing and, and learning why each brand is wonderful is a huge part of becoming a bigger enthusiast. Mm -hmm. So come say hello. I bought my Air King from Bruno uh, this past summer. I bought my GMT from John, who he was talking about. And I walked in and I, I dressed kind of like a bum every day. <laughs> you guys took me seriously and you sold me watches. You let me film in the store. It was a super fun experience. So I can tell you guys, uh, yeah, if you're ever here in Utah, come on by. Look, look at watches, even if you're not ready to purchase that day. It's a fun experience. You enjoy yes. it. And it, you know, it's, it only goes in a good direction, right? Agreed. Cool. Well, again, thanks for coming over to my house, yeah, Bruno, talking a little bit about your collection and what you're, you know, what you've got on the horizon, where you've been. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let us know if you have questions. We'll see you next time. Enjoy.